Hey, 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 closet busters and bold move makers. It is time once again for Life Uncloset. So I want you to gather around because it is time once again to kick down those closet doors of your life. We're here to escape our BS, explore our fears, and elevate our self-expression. I'm your host, Rick Clemens. I'm the bold move expert and that coming out guy who's going to take you to the party, the pulpit, the wake, and back to the party of living your life uncloset. So come on along with me and grab hold of yourself and get ready to step out, step up, and step into facing your fears, making your bold moves, and living life without apologies. Now let's get to the show. Hey, 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 Life Uncloseted families, those of you who are trying to break out of your closets or to live your bold life, it is time once again for Life Uncloseted. I'm your host, Rick Clemens, and if you are struggling to break out of something, make sure you hop on over to my website, rickclemens.com and take that little unapologetic life assessment, whether you're gay, straight, everything in between, you're going to find that that's something that can help you really break out and become a survivor of your own life. And today, because it is close to National Coming Out Day, and something that's always close to my heart is to really honor the stories that happen as we all come out of the closets of our life, especially my LGBTQ brothers and sisters, I thought it would be cool to talk about coming out and some of the pathways that we get here and some of the things we have to fight to get to be who we truly are. And it's no new news that there's still many, many states that believe that we gays can be cured. It just takes a little bit of conversion therapy and no, shoving anything up our ass or into our brain isn't going to change us. We are who we are. And today I have a guest who is a musician and an artist. He's got a beautiful piece of music called Survivors, another one called Scars. His name is Justin Utley, and he's going to come and share himself, his story, and he's pretty much just going to bitch slap the conversion therapy thing down that it don't work. It just don't (laughs) work. So, um, hey, Justin, welcome to the podcast, man. So glad to have you here. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so that's it. We're done. We kind of told the story. We can just <laughs> log out now. Um, no, I'm kidding. Justin and I have been chatting before we got on here, and I can tell we're going to have a really great conversation. And for those of you guys who are like, well, but what does he look like? He's pretty damn good looking. So um, you'll see. You'll see uh-huh. the pictures when I put it up there. But anyway, brother, welcome. Thank you for coming on here. And <laughs> You're welcome. This is, this is one of those, I, I can get really frustrated talking about this subject because it's like, wake the fuck up people this doesn't work but um before we like get there because you and i have already kind of had some of those conversations i'm sure you went through what most of us do that somebody somewhere said oh but you can be fixed you can be cured and um then they marched you off yeah it was um i mean it always kind of felt like i you know had these crushes on guys but i didn't really know what it meant and you know, someone called, you know, that they had a bro crush on someone. So I'm like, well, maybe mm-hmm. that's what this is. And maybe I just admire the football team instead of wanting to be with the football team. <laughs> 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 All that stuff in hindsight. But, you know, it was, a, it was a real fear of mine for that to make its way to the surface at any point in time growing up because I was a very devout Mormon. My family was very devout. We lived in a Mormon neighborhood and you know, you really don't have to go to a Mormon uh, private school because literally everyone on your block goes to the same church on Sunday. Yep. Yep. Um, And so you see the same people at school and, you know, it's, it's kind of a micro community within a bubble. Um, So there really isn't, um, there really isn't any room to try to, you know, to let anything slide out from under the rug, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So I, I kept it pretty hidden. um, And, I kind of felt like, okay, well, either everyone has these like bro crushes or whatever this is um, and no one talks about it or I'm the only one that does and I'm sure as hell not going to talk about it because, you know, no one else is. Yep. Yeah. But that's the thing is you're the only one. (laughs) I want to just say that, that literally for those of you who are like listening that you're in this space, I know you've had that thought, gosh, I'm the only one, even though you can see lots of other gay people out there in the world and all this stuff that feeling alone is like soul crushing. I'm the only one. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. And I, I went on my Mormon mission. uh, And while I was there, I actually saw gay porn on a Bishop's computer. He had forgotten to clear his history. I guess I shouldn't say 
that, that he forgot because there was apparently um, he has kids and a wife, so I can't say that he forgot. Right. But in all likelihood, <laughs> it probably mm -hmm. wasn't his ten-year-old. Um, but uh, that's when I saw porn for the first time um, at all, and I realized, yeah, this isn't just admiration. This is I'm I'm, I'm gay, and so it it really ripped my heart out. And when I got back home um, to Utah after my mission was over. Um, while I was going to college, I had a roommate that came out um, in a very loud and really kind of a, an angry way. Mm. And it really bothered me. And so I went to my bishop at that in that location and I told him, like, hey, I think I'm gay and this is what's happened on my mission and yada, yada. And, and he said, no, 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 you're not gay. Um, you have what's called same gender attraction disorder and we can fix this, but you have to do everything that I tell you, you know, all these tools in this box, basically, like you have to do all of them. You can't, you can't falter, you can't waver, um, but we can fix this. Um, I, you know, he said other people have been healed from this and this is a, this is a test of your devotion mm -hmm. to God and the church. And so since going through the Mormon temple, you swear an oath yeah. um, to support the church and its leaders, no matter what, mm -hmm. um, I felt like, well, this is the tools they're giving me. So this must, this must work. And so I dove in, you know, thinking that, you know, as you're describing this though, it's so interesting. And I've worked with many, many people coming from the Mormon faith. So I know a lot about this, but just the way you described how the, the Bishop said this to you, yeah. it's almost like here's their pat script. This is what we say. This is how yep. we tell you it's going to happen. This is exactly. Yeah. And it's so interesting that whether it's Mormon, Catholic, Seventh-day Adventist, Baptist, whatever it is, yeah. Oh, yeah. the script is always the same. The oh, script yeah. is always the same. Yes, they're going to all have their own little twisted version of how their faith's going to you know, fix you from this better than any other faith. But um, just that alone, and I hope those that might be listening who are struggling with this, to realize the script is all they know how to do. They just, yeah. and they do, and they do believe it. I mean, you know, God, you know, God bless them, whatever. They, they do believe it. But as you got through that, what was actually happening for you? It had to be some pain and some fear and some, but then yeah. some, also some belief too. Well, yeah. And like, um, uh, and today, basically people, sometimes people assume that I left the Mormon faith because of my sexual orientation and it's actually the opposite. Like I was trying to do everything to stay in. Mm -hmm, <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. Like I wasn't trying to get out I wasn't using it as an excuse for anything. Um, and with that feeling of being alone, um, my Bishop sent me to uh, two different types of, of conversion therapy. One was a group therapy. Some of them claim it was just a support group, but I mean, you, we had therapists, specialists, quote unquote, that, that, right. that are, able to help people diminish their same gender attraction um, and then books and videos and all sorts of stuff it was almost like an AA group except mm -hmm. everyone's still still gay <laughs> like right. and and no one's quote-unquote sober um, you don't get a pin or a ring or anything right um, and then I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a specialist at LDS family services which is their social services arm right. and mental health and so uh, they kind of went down some similar paths of what I understand on, on a lot of other levels, especially like the movie Boy Raced. And I know mm -hmm. the, the writer of that. And it's kind of a similar pattern where they try to identify something in your family history or the way you were brought up or a dynamic in your family and try to blame or, or center onto that as a mm -hmm. reason for your behavior. And for me, none of it really stuck. Um, and as far as like the religion goes, like it, Mormonism is supposed to be about family and keeping family together and, and this conversion therapy on any, any levels that it's been, it just, it tears families apart. Like I, I was you know, told that my dad must not have been there for me, which wasn't true. Um, my mom was overbearing, which definitely wasn't true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and you know, if, if those are the answers, then like both my brothers should be gay at this point, you know? Right. So how did that doesn't explain anything. Um, and so, you know, that feeling of alone, of being alone, and that, that, that feeling of isolation um, is dangerous because it mm -hmm. can lead to, you know, 
of going down that vacuum of self harm and, right. and eventually not wanting to exist. And so when I finally was able to go to that group and see and meet people that were in the same boat as me, it was amazing because I was like, oh my God, I'm not alone in this. There's people I can identify with and you know talk with, and I'm not so I'm not so alone anymore. Um, like they're in the same boat as me. But then like you know a year into it. Um, I'm kind of realizing like, okay, wait, so we're all in the same boat, but it's slowly sinking. Mm -hmm. This is probably not the right boat for everyone to be in. <laughs> like, right, right. We need someone else to be in a different boat. To come get us. Right. And, or you need to be seeing some, and I'm sure some, you saw some changes happening for some people because our minds are such an amazing thing that we can actually begin to buy buy the bullshit and believe and you know right, and for right. some people that they go on and they do that fine well, they go yeah, I mean, anyone can can change a behavior and yeah. that's what they claim that this was driven by um, right. and that that's where we could control things and you know it it only goes so far though because your your behavior i mean we're humans we're not animals so right. like there, there comes a breaking point where our desire our souls our spirits our emotions take over uh, when a dynamic of our lives aren't in balance. So if our sexual and intimate um, relationships and needs aren't being met, at some point there's going to be a breaking. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in about a year into it, um, I realized like, hey, this isn't working. Some of these guys have been going here for 10 years and I don't want to be doing this mm -hmm. for 10 more years. Like, screw that. You know, I, I was, I was, you know, assigned to, to date girls and like ask them out and, Right. tell them my status like it was an std <laughs> like, right I have, I have same gender attraction disorder and they were actually like oh i heard about it at church that's okay i'll help you mm. and it's just like you know and, it, and unfortunately for women it's kind of they kind of get left with this short end of the stick in mormonism yep. that, like they have to be married to get into heaven a man mm -hmm. doesn't have to be they can do it in the next life but a woman has to be which is so interesting because so that in and of itself, we're just back to the whole yeah, right, right. gender stuff that just, ugh, it's just like, <laughs> but like, so then the, the discussion turned to, well, if this isn't really the, uh, um, the history that we can pick apart. Mm -hmm. That's traditionally why you're gay. Then let's, let's dive into like childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. And so as we went down this road, um, the therapist had brought up the idea that I had been sexually assaulted as a child repeatedly and I just didn't remember because it was so awful. Um, but that's where I learned the behavior and my anxiety of it was coming back and causing me to behave like the person that taught me these things. All right. So it was a bit of a stretch, but you know, that was, that was deep in this, like I said, this box of tools that my bishop had given me. And I was like, well, damn it i've heard of this before you know these repressed memories of just these awful things happening and right yeah maybe that's right and so when i came out i didn't come out to my family that i was gay i came out to them that i had been raped as a child and <laughs> in utah unfortunately it's you have the highest uh child sex abuse in the nation so like one out of every four four girls and one out of every five boys have been sexually assaulted before they're mm. 18. And so with that statistic, it became believable that this could have been the case. Wow. Um, and so I ran with it and I was put on all these different medications for anxiety, depression, PTSD. And it, you know, it kind of, <laughs> it worked in the sense where it just literally made me emotionless. Yep. Um, but also just not fulfilled, not happy, not, yep. not alive at mm -hmm. all. Um, and it, it just kind of felt like a, a trap, like a rut, like, well, mm -hmm. okay, so it's, it's not fixing my attractions, but this is fixing the anxiety that's tied to it, I guess. And so yeah. I just kind of lived in that space for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was, and it's a, it's a scary space to be in because I went through the same thing, uh, not as deep, you know, um, because I had the conversations with the pastor in the seventh day Adventist church. And, and it wasn't like, it was more, you can change this. God wants you to change this. I'm like, okay, but I'm sitting here attracted to you, Mr. Pastor Matt. And there's nothing that there's no trauma that you've done to me. But even though I did have, I'm going to, I'm not, I, I hate even putting that label on it, that there was some sexual trauma when I was young, because to me, there wasn't trauma. It was when it happened. I'm like, 
oh, now that I see this nice big man dick, I get it. I, I get why I'm attracted at six, seven years old. Why I'm like, oh yeah, I want to play with that, you know? Yeah, yeah. And at that time it wasn't, you know, there wasn't love, but yet there kind of was because yeah. I'm like, okay, this makes sense to me now. And even to this day, those in my world who like, that's the reason I'm like, no, it wasn't the reason. It was not the reason. If nothing else that finally was like, okay, now I understand. This is why, okay, I, I get it. And um, you're right. This space where we end up where after I went back in the closet, I would say that's where I started to lose myself. Yeah. I, my emotions were not my true emotions. There was no fulfillment, even though I was doing everything in the world that everybody else was like, Oh, he should be really happy. Yeah. And Absolutely. it wasn't. I was getting by, but it wasn't where I was. And um, I think this is the danger that people don't realize. You know, it's so interesting because I just not long, actually, not long ago, got a, a um, review on this podcast about, well, it's great that people can come out, but, you know, they need to think about the people that they're hurting when they've been in a marriage and they come out. And I'm like, you're not getting this. You are not getting this. You're not getting this. You're not getting this. That yeah. statement alone right there is why somebody is in the closet because yeah. they're so afraid they're going to hurt somebody. They're so afraid of what people are going to think. And again, back to our current state of our lovely country right now, when rights are being taken away, right and left are attempting to be taken away. Why would anybody want to come out of the closet at this stage? Right. And then especially if you made the decision to get married to a woman and you have kids, like it almost seems just impossible to yep. of what it would be like to come out when you know unfortunately like the suicide rate of those are even yep. higher because there just comes like i said that breaking point where you can't live in that space right and um and i get the i can get the argument i've done some i've done more than share podcasts around the argument of well but if you knew then why did you follow through with it and i and i'm like yes i understand your perspective yeah, on that yeah. however the flip side is this society is not making it comfortable for somebody to say, okay, I'm this. Now right. everybody thinks, Oh, it's so much better. Yes, it is so much better. But again, I'm going to come back to current state of affairs. <laughs> it is not actually getting better. We're starting to go back again to worse because yeah, if yeah. we're looking at what's happening with our lovely administration in the U S everything is being done to once again, push the LGBTQ community into a second you know, we are second class citizens. So why would I want to be part of that? Yeah. So rather than lose that, I'm going to pretend to be somebody I'm not. I'm going to step into this. And I get it that, yes, somebody's going to get hurt. But do you want to be partially happy or not happy at all? And, and I think that's yeah. the questions that come up. And these men that were married and in that therapy group with me, I mean, at some point it breaks and they end up having some weird emotional relationship with another man or they go to these rest stops or these hookup places and they cheat on their wives on like apps and stuff. Like I've yep. met these guys and yep. it's a sad existence. And like, you can't tell me that this is, you know, this, this, you know, you know, think of the, the wife that this person's hurting and the kids. It's like, well, what about when they get caught at that rest stop by the police? Isn't that mm -hmm. going to be hurting them? Isn't that mm -hmm. more risky than them, you know, owning who they are and allowing their wife to find someone that's completely attracted to them and them both having the right to be happy? Right. You know, it's, it, it's easier said than done, I know, but I've seen, we've both seen the mm -hmm. other side of it and it is not pretty. I mean, well, and, it, and just it, the... it, it ends up in destroyed lives. If exactly. It ends up in destroyed lives either way. You can, I mean, I know, I know a lot of guys that I have worked with and I still know some guys who, some guys in my current circle of acquaintances and friends who, okay, I'm living this life, but don't let anybody else know I'm living this life. They're open to some of us, but to their kids, um, grown children. Oh yeah, but they don't know. And of course I'm going, trust me, they know, they, yeah. they can yeah. see this. <laughs> but but what is sad is, okay, so you're supposed to just stay in this closet and either, quote, live alone and not act on this or live alone and act on it in secret or pursue this, what people think is the perfect life of being married in a heterosexual relationship. 
and then constantly be covering your tracks or not doing anything and being completely miserable. And then the marriage is on the rocks anyway, because this isn't where you're supposed to be. Right. But as you and I know, and many who've listened to this podcast, have heard me say this hundreds of times, everybody gets hung up on the sexual piece of this. It's not just about sex. In fact, no. it was never just about sex. No. There's so much more. Yeah, one of these therapy camps that um, a spinoff group of the one I went to, uh, and my ex-husband actually ended up attending these, um, they kind of take this intimacy part of it and try to fulfill the intimate part of your, of, of your needs um, without the sex. And so it really just kind of really fucks it up basically mm -hmm. if, if i can actually say that yeah yeah absolutely okay man. this isn't okay yeah <laughs> um, he can say it, whatever it, the it fuck just, we want to on this <laughs> podcast, so. it basically separates the sexual desire from the intimacy so you know it, it vilifies the sexual act it it, it almost actually it does it, it, it does it strips you of your identity as a gay man it strips you of any respect or any sort of association you have with that and it and it basically dissolves that part of your existence to where it's nothing but a an intimate need with another man so it, mm -hmm. it, it you know these these men go on these holding sessions together where you know they their wives are upstairs playing cards and all the men are downstairs like cuddling and pulling each other and like it you know if their wives came down and saw what they were doing they would lose their minds yeah but they have this idea in their head that what they're doing is healthy and it's absolutely not. And he, you know, mm -hmm. this one gentleman told me, well, after I have a good touching session, a healthy touch session with my touch partner, you know, I'm all turned on and I can go, I can go home and, and have sex with my wife. I'm like, well, yeah, of course you did because you're basically getting cock teased for two yeah, hours. Exactly. Exactly. Night, you, exactly. You know, and, and it, so again, it's a false sense of, okay, security of living, whatever it might be. And I just Ugh. go, God, it's so unhealthy. And there's so many mental gymnastics to get exactly. around what just essentially is like you're, you're, a, you're a bisexual or wherever you are at on that, on that spectrum. But like, you know, clearly you weren't, you weren't educated enough to make this decision to get married or you were afraid or perhaps mm -hmm. your partner or spouse didn't know what they were really getting into. Um, especially in, in, in Mormonism, it's still, like I said, yeah. it's kind of a, a bad deal for the women. And a lot of them say yes to these types of marriages. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then they, you know, just 10, 10 years down the road, shit hits the fan. Um, so I'm curious, based on this whole experience for you, what do you feel like other than, you know, the revelation of this isn't working, but what did you learn most from the experience that's helped you as a person? that when I finally was able to get the courage to come out to my family, that it was, an, it was a beautiful and heartbreaking experience because mm -hmm. nearly everyone had the exact opposite reaction than I thought they would have. And, and, and in my, my uh, journey, basically, I had left the therapy group to date um, a man that was a guy in the gym and about six months later he passed away from a heart attack and, mm. and that threw me you know <laughs> threw me a huge curveball because sure. here you know I, I tried to do everything I could all these tools in this little box that my bishop gave me and, and none of them worked and then I tried to date someone and I was happy but now they're gone and so I went back to my bishop and told him you know, I needed some guidance that nothing was working on either side. And, and he actually said that God took Brent away from me because I wasn't supposed to be in a homosexual relationship. Mm. And that as a, yeah, as a, as a holder of the priesthood, which is a, as a hierarchy in the Mormon church, right. Um, I should have known better. And now I have to pay for the sins of, of the flesh of what I've done with my boyfriend. Mm. And you know, that fear tactic had worked before, but this time I was just like, you know what, you don't, you have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. And like, it's this power trip that you're on and this, this, this love that you don't understand that you think is just this carnal, 
you know, damnable mm -hmm. offense when it was actually one of the most awesome things I'd ever felt. And so when I finally told my mom shortly after that, uh, she, she cried and she said that, you know, thank you for telling me I'm mad. You know, I'm upset that you felt like you couldn't have told me this whole time. And it makes me feel like I failed as a mother that you couldn't have told me. And now I don't get to meet someone that meant so much to you. Mm -hmm. And please don't let that happen again. And it was, it was really beautiful. And, and my family is, it took, some of them a little while to come around, but it, it's all in all, they've, they've been wonderful. They've, they've came to most of the events that are local that I do for marriage equality when that was on mm -hmm. the table and, you know, most of my gigs they try to make. And it's just, it's really beautiful to see, you know, their minds open and, and some people feel that it's an unfortunate thing or like it, it shouldn't have to take someone to come out for them to change their mind. But, you know, I'm glad it did. Like, if it hadn't been for me coming out, maybe my dad would have had that same belief that he'd had his whole life and it wouldn't mm -hmm. have changed me. You know, people have blamed politicians for flip-flopping on the issue, but you know what? I'm, I'm glad they're on board when, when they are. Right. You know, some of them might have different motives, but hey, you know what? Like, we are here to gain visibility. We're not trying to have any special treatment or rights. We just want to be treated the same way and the same respect mm -hmm. and dignity that everyone else has. And I'm always so, and I've had conversations with people who are so on the other side of this conversation. And the one that always stops them in their tracks is when I say, so, okay, I get, you have your beliefs. I get all this sort of stuff. Okay. You're going to go crawl in bed tonight and go to sleep. I'm going to go crawl in bed tonight and go to sleep. How is my life affecting yours? What is it that I'm doing that is absolutely bottom line affecting yours that you're going to lay in bed all night long tonight because my life is having such an impact on yours? And they can never answer that question. Yeah. They can I never. Mean, they have tried to say, well, you know, it's not what, okay, God doesn't want me to do that. How does that affect you? How does right. that affect you? That's well, between the, me and God. Right. You know? in, the, in Mormonism, it, the leaders have spoken out and, and said things like, you know, it's not that it doesn't hurt anyone else. The fact is it will bring down civilization. It will, mm -hmm. it will destroy the family. It will do this and do that. And, you know, marriage passed and we're still here. Right. <laughs> and, like, and the thing is, is this has been, <laughs> this has been around it's, as long yeah. as we can identify. Right. This is but not something brand new. It's fear and control. I mean, they, uh -huh. you know, these, people that are against uh, being uh, LGBT community, having any sort of equal existence right. is just, it's all about controlling fear and it doesn't make sense to me anymore. Mm -mm. Um, but I, I mean, I was, I was pretty anti-gay at one point. I remember like closing a bank account at a bank because they supported gay pride. And I was just, oh, I can't believe they would do that. And, mm -hmm. da, 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 da. and but I, I, I get it. I get both sides of it. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's just a, always as fascinating. As absurd of a claim as I, as I remember it being, it was a very real concern. Yeah, it was a real feeling. And I know, I guess, coming from, coming from the Seventh-day Adventist perspective, and I think this is where most faith people kind of emanate from on this, if I didn't do everything I can to help you get into heaven, then I'm not going to get there. Yep. Yeah. There's, there's an element of that in Mormonism too. It's a, it's yeah. A, it's like, if I don't do this, it's, a, it's my chit that's not going to get me that doorway yeah. into heaven. And I'm yeah. like, well, and I actually said this to somebody not long ago because this person was like hounding me about stuff. And, and usually I just walk away. Like, I'm not going to do this. And I finally had had enough. And I said, well, let me tell you this. I would much rather believe in a God who isn't going to have, here's your check marks to heaven than to believe in one that says, if you don't have these check marks, you don't get in. I just, I can't have a relationship with that kind of a God because I think the God that I know is going to look at me and go, you know what, Rick, overall, yeah, you, you did some things that probably weren't the best, but overall you're a good guy. So come on in. Yeah. If, 
in the grander yeah, scheme of right, things, right. if everything is what we all think it is. And I'm not yeah, saying yeah. I don't believe, I believe there's a higher power. I believe there's something more beyond us doing all this stuff, but it's always so interesting to have those conversations because bottom line, as you said, and you said it so eloquently is it comes down to control and fear. And it truly comes down to what am I, what's going to happen if I don't do something, what's going to happen to me. Yep. And I just want to say, nothing's going to happen to you. You did your stuff. God's going to go, okay, they tried, but you know, hey, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it didn't work. If that's I mean, really I, what it is. The thing is, is all of this is supposition in my book. Yeah. That's the way I look yeah. at it. All supposition that any of this is really what it is. So, um, I mean, I was told like, you know, if you don't do everything in this box, you will not see your family in the next mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. It was, it was as real as the sun at that point. I yep. thought, my God, I got to do everything I can to make sure I get this fixed. Um, and you then know, like my family, my dad actually started going on this, well, me and him went on this pseudo witch hunt to try to find out who it could have been in my neighborhood growing up that could have molested me. And so I remember calling my cousin and, and, you know, thinking about who it could have been. And my therapist would say, you know, do you recall, you know, a house that made you uncomfortable as a kid and you'd run past it. Maybe that was the house. Mm. And, you know, at the time I'm like, Oh my God. Yeah. I remember doing that as a kid. <sighs> And now it's I'm thinking, so just, what, what kid doesn't run past that uh, and freaks them out? You know right. what I mean? Yeah. But it's, like, a, it, it's so contrived. That's what bothers me the most is when it gets in, into that cr contrived space. So let's create the story and then people wish we could go off on that because that's so much of what's going on in our, yeah, our yeah, world yeah. right now today. But um, yeah. so let's talk about the music real quick before we wrap it up here. So you got two great songs. One's just come out. Um, Scars has just come out, but you have the Survivors one. Yep. All of these point in some ways to pieces, parts of this whole entire journey. And um, I mean, I'm sure the inspiration was because this has got to be said and it's got to be said in a way that I can say it that's in my wheelhouse of what I'm all about. But when you first started doing this, was there like, yes, I'm going to write these or, okay, I think I'm going to go here. And was there a little bit of trepidation or where was it for you, man? Oh my God. Yeah. It was rough. Like I had started um, sort of writing pretty vaguely about my journey at the beginning. And then I met a music agent in New York when I moved there and he said, you know, don't talk about being gay. Don't talk about your Mormon stuff. It's just weird. Don't talk about conversion therapy. That's weird. People don't get it. People don't understand it. And so then I spent time just feeling like, well, now I'm just like, all the other guys walking around Central Park with a guitar trying to get people to listen to. Mm -hmm. And then a couple years down the road, I ended up doing a gig at the bitter end, which is kind of this cool, like, like CBGB's place, like Janis mm -hmm. Joplin played there type of thing. And I'd played there before, but I played this song called goodbye, goodbye. And it was a song I wrote in, uh, <laughs> after I found out that my girlfriend was cheating on me, but I was in ex gay therapy at the time. So it, it didn't really matter. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> like, you know, more power to her for finding someone that would actually make out with her. So, you know, I just thought I was being righteous, but you know, mm -hmm. if that was just the excuse. Um, but I, I sang the song and at the end I subbed in a line saying, Hey bitch, I'm gay. And the crowd laughed and I'm like, no, that's really the case. I, this, I wrote this because of this. And everyone's like, Oh my God. And I played another song and told them about that. And, the the venue director came down he's just like what the hell was that like you've never said anything like that before i'm like well yeah i was told not to it just seemed disingenuous since i threw that in there i wanted to explain what it was about and he's like well no whoever told you that's an idiot because mm -hmm. now everyone's going to remember who you are like tonight they're not going to remember any of the other musicians on the on the bill like yep. they will remember who you are yep and that's when i felt like you know okay this works and so i started mm -hmm. being more open about my story and my journey and um, then marriage equality was kind of uh, the hot ticket and I was really passionate about it and and I wrote stand for something and then that kind of blew up and I realized like I had something to say and, and then I was saying it in a way that people could relate and it wasn't so specific that it alienated people but it was mm -hmm. a way that I could bring people together and mm -hmm. with scars it's it's probably the most emotional raw and gritty project I've ever done it's outside my comfort zone of kind of the alt country thing it's much more anthemic pop rock and yeah. um, it's dark it's um, it's basically about all those scars that I've tried to cover up 
and realizing that that's what makes us all unique and that we should be celebrating those things that have left those marks either internally or externally Mm -hmm. and celebrating the fact that we're alive to tell our stories and to share them and to be alive. And so um, whether it's conversion therapy or whether it's a relationship um, or losing someone to suicide, which are all things that are talked about on that album. Yeah. uh, Those are the beautiful things. Once we get through the pain that unfold into like a really beautiful existence and mm-hmm. as, as, as bittersweet as it can be sometimes um it's it's awesome to look back and appreciate the scars and that's mm-hmm. what that was about you know as you were talking about that i received a, a card from my speaking coach after i did a talk um back in july and she had worked with me for this. And then we both happened to be on the same stage. And it was just, it was a co- very cool experience. And the card, and this relates to you too. <laughs> the front of the, I've never seen a card like this before. I've never seen, I mean, I'm pretty good at finding like these really cool cards, but she found the best one. She, in the front of the card says, when you do things from your soul, other people really dig that shit. And... <laughs> It's really, I mean, it's on my desk now. It's like every time I'm having self doubts, I'm like, no, Rick, when I do, you know, these podcasts, like you and I are having this conversation right now, this is the soul stuff and people, I know this will be a huge hit. Not that that's what I'm going for, but it will, because people want to hear this real stuff that we're talking about because it gives them hope. It gives them the ability to realize they are not alone and it gives them that desire to go, okay, wow. I can probably go do this too. And I love that that's what your music is bringing to the world besides that it's great music and that you're giving (laughs) of yourself. Thank you. And that you're showing people there is a way. Well, Mike, um, the the change in the genres too, like I, I, and thank you for saying that. I just, it's important to me also to be authentic to my story and to myself and mm -hmm. to make sure that like, that something kitschy doesn't get in the way or Um, cause I think in today's day and age, politically, especially, but also in the entertainment world, we're kind of starved for anything that's actually authentic. Yep. And I kind of want to break that. Um, some people said, well, you don't have to release an album. You can just release a single after a single after a single. And I'm like, no, these songs belong together. They were created together. They were experienced together. They link together. And I can't, you know, I guess I'm old fashioned at one point, I'd love to have a vinyl copy of this and just, you know what I mean? To have that yep. experience of, of having that, you know, front to back experience of playing them all. It's just mm-hmm. it's important to me to have that authenticity. And I, and I hope that conveys through what we've talked about and also through the music that I've written. Well, I know for me it has. And um, I just want to tell you how much I've enjoyed this conversation, man. And so glad that we got brought together and that you're doing what you're doing out in the world, Justin. Likewise. And, and don't stop. <laughs> I mean, not that, not that I need to be daddy. Well, I'm already a daddy, but anyway. Um, but, you know, just I, I do don't stop doing it. I, I need, do need the encouragement. It does get a little isolating sometimes. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you feel like, I'm sure you do too. Like, yep. is anyone even listening right now? Because, mm-hmm. like, I feel like the world is just turned against me or everything that's good. And yeah. so I appreciate it. Thank and you. all it takes is the one person that says, wow. I heard that conversation and I so needed to hear that, you know, and then boom, there you go. Amen. Amen. All right, bro. Well, thanks so much again for being here. We will have all of the stuff to follow Justin. We'll have his songs. We'll have some tracks. We'll have some videos up on the show page. Make sure you go check those out and um, keep following him because every one of us has a survivor within us. And we just got to trust that we have that and we can make things happen. So thanks again for being here, man. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, 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 Life Uncloseted family. Another episode of Life Uncloseted has come to an end and it is time for all of us to sashay away and go face our fears, make those bold moves and stand up to living our life without apology. But before you do, I've got a favor to ask of you. Would you hop over to iTunes or Spotify or Podbean or wherever it is that you're listening to this and just give us a little bit of love if you like what we're doing here at Life Uncloseted. Here's what it does. It helps other people find the show. It helps other people get to know what we're all about. And you just might help change life. In fact, if you really want to change a life, 
we'd love it if you just ask a friend to take a listen and see what they think. So that's it. Love you all deeply. I'm Rick Clemens, the host of Life Uncloseted and never stop stepping out, stepping up and stepping in to living your life uncloseted. <laughs>